just want to say that um, it really is a, a privilege and an honor to, to present. Uh, basically, I consider him my pastor for life, uh, someone who has uh, dedicated his life to teaching the Word of God. And just to give you an idea, uh, and I call him a dinosaur, he teaches seven times a week. Seven times a week, he taught. And I'll tell you, I wish I could be at every one of those uh, teaching sessions. And for the majority of the time, I was. And uh, it's just uh, to find a man that's just truly, truly dedicated to teaching the Word of God. And tonight, he gets to present uh, uh, something that I'm really excited about. It's called the pre rap rapture position. So uh, without, uh, without going on, I want to introduce uh, my pastor, Mr. Long. Prophecy. Rapture prophecy. Gee, we missed our opportunity in May. <laughs> you have another one in October. Okay, so don't be too concerned about it until it comes and goes, which it will. Orientation to the rapture of the church, which probably all of us are familiar with, the Bible truth that Jesus Christ, when he comes back, will gather all living believers out from the earth to meet him in the sky. Along with that, all believers who have died will also be resurrected and they will be gathered together. There are four popular views of the rapture. You can see them clearly illustrated there. The box itself represents the 70th week of Daniel. We will talk more about that later. It is seven years in length. And the first position is the pre-trib rapture position, which teaches that the Lord will come in the sky and remove believers from the earth prior to the beginning of that seven-year period. That position, which we will discuss a little bit later in more detail, does not consider that that arrival of Jesus is the second coming. It teaches that the second coming will occur at the end of that seven year period, which is not indicated on that particular chart, except for the post-trib rapture position, the fourth one, is the position that, will, that teaches that the rapture will occur at the end of the seven year period. The mid-trib position, you can see how the diagram shows you the midpoint of the week. I'm supposed to be using this thing. There it is, the midpoint of the week, which is three and a half years into the week. That's why it's called the midpoint, for the week is seven years long. The mid-trib position teaches that the rapture will occur at that time. The fourth position is called the pre rapture position. It teaches that the Lord will return in the clouds of the sky, power and great glory, and at that time gather all believers from the earth. It will occur sometime after the midpoint of the week, but prior to the end of the week, with at least five months prior to the end of the week. We understand, as probably all of you understand, that the rapture is taught to be at an unknown day and hour. Therefore, we cannot determine what day and hour it is. Pre-trib position counts on that concept quite heavily. We'll talk about that later. The pre rap position, I don't like this. The pre rap position <laughs> teaches that the Lord will return at an unknown day or hour after the midpoint of the week but prior to the end of the week, and since, of course, we don't know the day or the hour, we don't know when it will occur. But based on what happens after the return of the Lord, and we'll discuss that, <coughs> specifically, the fifth trumpet judgment, which lasts for five months, indicates that the return of the Lord and the rapture must occur at least five months prior to the end of the week. Well, that's the basic introduction to that four views of the rapture. This morning, our brother Jerry, in introducing his subject, discussed the golden rule of interpretation, which is something that we need to follow. 
It says, when the plain sense of Scripture makes common sense, seek no other sense. Therefore, take every word at its primary, ordinary, usual, literal meaning. Unless the context indicates otherwise. Facts study in the light of related passages comparing Scripture with Scripture and establish truths, axiomatic, establish truths and fundamental truths indicate clearly otherwise. If there's something in or through the comparison of Scripture that indicates this common sense understanding, this literal sense understanding, needs to be taken differently than it should be taken differently. Otherwise, logic, common sense, literal, ordinary, usual, primary meaning. This is the standard that should be followed. There are five factors then that I like to use for proper interpretation of Scripture and specifically prophecy. We need to compare assumptions with stated facts. We need to understand and establish proper definitions. We need to consider chronological accuracy. We need to understand who the recipients are of the passages involved. And, of course, we need to compare Scripture with Scripture. We need to compare passages. Assumptions versus stated facts. This is crucial with regard to studying the rapture positions. And I'm going to primarily concentrate on comparing the pre-trib position with the pre rapture position. John Walbert acknowledged in his book, The Rapture Question, that neither post-tribulation nor pre-tribulation is an explicit teaching of Scripture. I partly disagree with that. Pre-tribulation is certainly not an explicit teaching in Scripture. The concept of post-tribulationism, when understood with proper definitions, is explicitly stated in Scripture. But it's not the classic post-tribulational view. This will become more clear as we progress. Which reminds me, I should make a comment about the handout that you have received. This is a worksheet. This is something for your own personal study. I won't be going over the worksheet. The worksheet includes a chart, a very detailed and complicated chart. But through a little bit of concentration, you'll see that there is a certain order to that chart. 53 references are placed below that. Your assignment, should you choose to accept it, <laughs> is to read each of the passages and place them where you think they should go on that chart. As a result of my teaching tonight, hopefully, it will be a very simple process. So you can do with the chart as you please. Hopefully, it will not be a, neg a negative action. So let's look at some assumptions. Dispensational preconceptions. This is one of the big concerns of the pre-tribulational view. It is claimed that the church cannot be on the earth at the same time that God is specifically dealing with Israel. Now I have quite a bit of information to go through and some of the details I won't be able to go to uh, with a lot, a lot of time. I can't go into all the details of dispensations. But when dispensations are understood with proper biblical definition, we realize that there's really no compromise, there's no conflict, and there is no stated fact that the church cannot be on the earth at the same time that God is supposedly dealing only with Israel. The main thing I want to mention about dispensations is that dispensations do, do not concern whom God is dealing with. Dispensations concerns whom God is using to minister to the entire world. And between each of the dispensations, which simply means a period of time where God uses a particular body to communicate His truth to the world, between each of these dispensations, there is a transitional period where you have both 
kind of functioning at the same time. So there really is no conflict if the church is present at the same time. But the point I want to make is that to state that the church cannot be present is an assumption. It is not a stated fact. And one of the keys to interpretation is to compare assumptions with stated facts. <clears throat> Another assumption. The church is not mentioned after Revelation chapter 3. This is an assumption that is based on a failure to properly relate to terms. This is an argument from silence. You've heard about those before. The presence of the church is not determined by the presence of the word church. Ecclesia in Greek. The book of 2 Timothy, the book of Titus, the book of 1st and 2nd Peter, 1st and 2nd John, and the book of Jude. These books do not contain the word church. So if we want to make a statement that the word church does not occur after chapter 3 of Revelation, perhaps we should throw out these other books as having any application to the church, since the word church does not occur in those books either. But of course, it's ludicrous. In the book of Revelation, the word saints occurs. The word saints occurs about 59 times in the New Testament. And always it refers to Christians, believers. There needs to be a good reason to look at the word saints in Revelation and say it does not refer to the church. So it is an assumption to say that saints does not refer to church. In Revelation 14, 13, we have the term, those who die in the Lord. In verse 12, 17, we have those who hold to the testimony of Jesus. Now, who are those who die in the Lord? We have a stated fact concerning the existence of those who die in the Lord. And those who hold to the testimony of Jesus. Who are these? Is there any reason to think that they are not Christian? There needs to be a clear indication that that is the case. <clears throat> At Revelation 4.1, one of the very favorite passages of the pre-tribulation view, in John's vision, as he is being shown these things, all of a sudden, He's taken into heaven. Prior to that, he's been shown things that are on the earth. Letters to the seven churches. Now all of a sudden, he's taken into heaven. Why? Because God now wants to show him things that are going to take place from the sphere of heaven. The pre-tribulational view likes to say that when John is taken to heaven, this portrays the rapture. I don't know if you've heard of that position. So when John is taken to heaven, this is the rapture. But you know what? Throughout his visions, John gets taken back down to earth a few times. <laughs> Whoops. What happens then? And then he's taken back to a heavenly scene again. And does it say that the church is raptured at 4-1? No, it simply says that John is taken to heaven. So this is an assumption. Furthermore, Right after John, uh, Revelation chapter 4, verse 1, we have the scene of what's going on in heaven, chapter 4 and chapter 5. And the church is not mentioned in chapter 4 and chapter 5. That is the word church. And yet that is where it's supposed to be mentioned, right? If the rapture just took place. But it's not mentioned there. Oh, but there are 24 elders there. And that's the church. Is that an assumption or a stated fact? is an assumption. Who are the recipients of the book of Revelation? In chapter 1-1 one, one, and chapter 22-6, at the beginning and at the end, it says, to his bond servants. Who are his bond servants? The church. To whom was the book written? To the church. Why? Because the church needed this information. It is pertinent to them. Here's another assumption. The church must be removed from the earth before Daniel's 70 week begins. I thought I had a chart there. 
Well, we have the 70th week of Daniel again, that seven year period. The assumption is that the church must be removed before it begins. Why? Because uh, the first assumption is that there cannot be the presence of the church on the earth the same time that Israel is being specifically dealt with by God. So it must be removed from the earth before Daniel's 70th week begins. One of the reasons for this is because uh, the position teaches that the 70th week of Daniel is given to God's people or Israel, the people of Israel only. Because in Daniel 9, which we'll look at at some time, it says, 70 weeks have been determined for your people. But once again, it is an assumption to say that the church must be removed. Just because the 70 weeks are for Israel, it does not mean that they cannot be for the church as well. It does not exclude the church. There is no direct statement that indicates that. It is another assumption. What about eminence? We'll talk about eminence later. Also, a detailed study on eminence tomorrow afternoon at 1.30. But a little bit tonight. Hopefully I'll get to it. The concept, I'm not even going to call it a doctrine of, the concept of eminence, which is pre-trib's primary cornerstone after dispensationalism, teaches that there are no prophesied events that must be fulfilled before the rapture occurs. Basically, it can occur at any time. If we see a few people disappear all of a sudden, then we'll know that the pre rapture position is an error. That won't happen. <clears throat> this also is an assumption, and it's also based on an erroneous understanding of what eminence is based on. Okay, pre trib's only fact. Everything about the pre trib rapture is an assumption. I've hit the high points, all assumptions. We can talk about other things as well. Everything is an exception. Everything is an assumption except the fact that the church will be removed before God's wrath comes upon the unbelieving world. That's one fact, the only fact that pre trib can claim. Everything else is an assumption. The second issue in interpretation. First one was the issue of comparing assumption with stated facts. The second issue is proper definitions. We have to have a proper definition of these five factors in order to properly understand the rapture position. We have to understand what is the tribulation? What is the 70th week? What is wrath? What is the day of the Lord? And what is the second coming? How does the Bible interpret those things? So what about the tribulation? The traditional view is to define the tribulation as, number one, beginning at the start of Daniel's 70th week and going until its end. So again, we have that same chart. Should you see this? I don't need to. You can see it. You can see where the... Uh, covenant is signed and the 70th week begins. Okay, right there. That's the start of the week. Free trib operates on the premise that that begins the tribulation. And the tribulation will continue until the end of the 70th week. And that is where the second coming will occur in the Battle of Armageddon. The reign of the beast, which you probably heard about, goes for the 42 months from the midpoint of the week to the end. You've heard of the term the Great Tribulation. It is used to describe the time from the midpoint to the end. So once again, ah, once again, the midpoint of the week, right in the middle. Okay, that's where the Great Tribulation begins, and pre-trib likes to designate the term Great Tribulation as being different from Tribulation, so that the Tribulation begins at the beginning of the week, goes to the end, and the Great Tribulation begins at the midpoint of the week, and goes to the end. The second issue of the traditional view, 
The technical term, the Great Tribulation, is used to designate the time from the midpoint. I already did that. I went back a long way, didn't I? The third one. And it will be terminated, that is, the Tribulation will be terminated at the Battle of Armageddon and the physical descent of Jesus to the earth at that time. This is the traditional view of the Tribulation. Once again, on the chart, you can see the end of the week, second coming in Armageddon. However, the Bible makes it clear that the tribulation will begin at the midpoint of the week and not before. Let's turn in our Bibles, please, to Matthew chapter 24.
verse 21. For then there will be great tribulation. Now we have the word then again, but also we have the word for in front of it to explain it. For then, when? At the time that this abomination of desolation is set up. But the abomination of desolation being set up is explaining the tribulation that you will be delivered to in verse 9. What is the abomination of desolation? I'm going to have to play on frame of reference for some of you. If you have questions, of course, we can deal with them later. I might be able to get to it a little bit later as well. But this is when the man of lawlessness, some of you know the term the beast, this is when he will break the covenant that was established at the beginning of the 70th week. He will break the covenant. He will set himself up in the temple of God and, and, and proclaim himself as God. He will probably set up a statue of himself in that holy place, which is considered an abomination. And this is when the tribulation begins. At verse 21 it says, for, this will be, for then there will be a great tribulation. And this is where the idea of a technical term for great tribulation comes in. But at verse 9 he called it tribulation. And when does that tribulation begin? At the midpoint of the week. This is when the man of lawlessness will break the covenant and set up his statue in the holy place and proclaim himself as God. This is at the midpoint. The tribulation begins at the midpoint. It doesn't begin at the start of the 70th week. It begins at the middle of the 70th week. The language then at verse 9, the language therefore at verse 15, and the language at verse 21, for then, makes it very clear that Jesus is talking about the same period of time, and it begins at the midpoint of the week. <clears throat> Verse 2, uh, point 2, <laughs> and that it will be interrupted, that is the tribulation, will be interrupted and ended before the end of the week. Look at verse 22. And unless those days had been cut short, the Greek indicates an amputation, an interruption. Unless those days had been cut short, no life would have been saved, delivered, physically delivered. In other words, if this period of tribulation, everyone killing Christians, as we have was already described in verse 9 and following. If that is not interrupted, everyone who does not worship the beast, everyone who does not take the mark of the beast will have been killed. Which means there will be no believers left on the earth. Well, there, have to, there has to be, there must be believers left on the earth after the battle of Armageddon because believers will go, those believers will go alive into the thousand year reign of the Messiah. So this period of tribulation, great persecution, must be interrupted. And God said, it says here that God will interrupt those days. I don't know why I have that chart again, but there's a midpoint of the week. Again. And uh, somewhere at least five months before the end of the week. Oh, there it is. Right here. This is when the tribulation will be cut short. What will cut short the tribulation? We'll talk about that. The third point. Its end, the, that is the end of the tribulation, will be indicated by special signs in the sun, moon, and stars. And awesome things on the earth. Two passages, Matthew 24, emphasizes the things in the sun, moon, and stars, while the Luke passages focuses on uh, the awesome things happening on the earth. Uh, we will look just at the Matthew 24 passage since we are here, and I cannot look at every single passage that uh, is pertinent because you guys want to go home sometime tonight. Verse 29. Immediately after the tribulation of those days. Well, the tribulation will be cut short. So when it is cut short, something's going to be happening. 
The sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, and the stars will fall from the sky, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Those are the signs in the sun, moon, and stars. <clears throat> that is what indicates the end of the tribulation. And then Jesus will return in the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. We continue in Matthew. Well, one of the other signs, verse 30, is that uh, they will see uh, then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky. We don't know what that is. It doesn't tell us. It just says something is going to indicate here comes Jesus. <laughs> okay? I don't think it will be a cross. But <laughs> or a fish. Continuing at verse 30. And then all the tribes of the earth will mourn. This is after they see the sign of the Son of Man. They go, oh, something's going to tell them Jesus is coming. And then I have what I thought I had. <clears throat> Continuing at verse 3. After they mourn, when they see some indication that Jesus is coming, then they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky, with power and great glory. So that's the next thing that happens. <clears throat> Notice it says, which will occur, this is point five, which will occur at an unknown day and hour before the end of the week. You can jump to Matthew 24, verse 36. The subject, as you can see in this discourse by Jesus, is the second coming. Concerning this second coming at verse 36, but of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father alone. What passage does the pre-tribulational view use to teach imminence? This one. What is imminence? He can come back at any time. No one knows the day or the hour. But this is talking about the coming of the Lord after he's already said that it will occur after the tribulation of those days. So the idea of no one knows the day or the hour is within the context of the end of the tribulation. And that does not establish that there is a day or hour. Because the tribulation will be cut short of its supposed duration and ended. And so it still constitutes no one knows the day or the hour. Point six. There's no distinction between the tribulation and the great tribulation. For they are one and the same. I already showed you in Matthew 24 how that is established. I want to show you something else how it's established. Mark 13, 19. Mark 13, 19. Chapter 13 of Mark is Mark's record of the Olivet Discourse, the same teaching that we just looked at in Matthew 24. At verse 14, at verse 14 of Mark 13, Mark records, But when you see the abomination of desolation standing where it should not be, let the reader understand, let, then let those who flee, and let those who are in Judea flee. Skip down to verse 19. For those days will be a time of tribulation. Such has not occurred since the beginning of the creation, which God created until now, nor ever shall be. If the term great tribulation was designed to be a technical term to refer to just uh, the period of time from the midpoint to the end, in contrast to the tribulation, which was supposedly to begin at the middle, uh, at, at the start of the uh, 70th week, then it would have been indicated here as well. But Mark makes no big deal about the word great. Why? Because the word great is simply used to indicate its intensity, not to establish a technical term. So there is no technical term, the great tribulation. Great is simply a word to indicate intensity. Even when it is used in Revelation chapter 6, when it talks about the great multitude that John sees in heaven, and the angel says, where did these come from? And John says, I don't know, you know. So he tells him, he says, these are the ones who have come out of the great tribulation. 
But the word great there is still not used to indicate some technical period of time, but simply to indicate its intensity. Oh, that's it, right. Number seven, and the tribulation is not an expression of God's wrath, but the expression of Satan's wrath on all who will not take the mark of the beast and worship him. Let's look at Revelation 12. The book of Revelation. Pre-tribulation teaches that the wrath of God begins at the start of the 70th week. That this is a time when God will express his wrath on the earth. chart here. No, I <clears throat> The first part of the week is started when a political genius makes a covenant with the people of the Middle East so that they will be able to worship in a, an established holy place or sanctuary in their land, the Jewish people. But it also has to be made with the Arab people who are there, the Islamic population, because right now, uh, if the Jews try to build a holy place and offer animal sacrifices, not only would the Islamic population be really, really upset, but don't you think that probably the entire world would be upset? Look at these people offering lambs in their temple. This is terrible. So there needs to be some kind of peace treaty or covenant that allows everybody in the area to worship the way you want to. A seven-year covenant is established, and it is specifically a seven-year covenant. So that this give peace a try concept might be instituted. And so for the first three and a half years, it is indeed a time of peace. There is no conflict going on. Everyone's getting along. Everyone's enjoying worship the way they want to. There's no wrath of God coming upon them for the first three and a half years. Then when the tribulation begins, Revelation chapter 12, it is still claimed that this is God's wrath. Again, we're trying to establish definitions and I'm trying to do it as quickly and as uh, clearly as I can. Let's start at verse 7. There was war in heaven. Michael and his angels waging war with the dragon. Dragon represents Satan. Dragon and his angels waged war. They were not strong enough and there was no room. No longer a place found for them in heaven. The great dragon was thrown down, the serpent of old, who is called the devil and Satan. And he was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. Verse 10. And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come from the accuser of our brethren has been thrown down, who accuses them before our God day and night. Uh, I jump over 11. Uh, verse 12. For this reason rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them, for woe to the earth and the sea, because God's going to pour out his wrath on you. No. Because the devil has come down to you having great wrath, knowing that he has only a short time. And when the dragon saw that he was thrown down to the earth, he persecuted the woman. The woman represents Israel. Details which we cannot go into now. Represents Israel, not in belief, but in unbelief, but they are still God's chosen people. Look at verse 15. <clears throat> and the serpent poured water like a river out of, oh, I'm sorry, uh, verse 14. Two wings of the great eagle were given to the woman in order that she might fly into the wilderness to her place where she was nourished for a time, times and half a time, which was three and a half years, the second half of the week. She needs that protection for the entire period of time. Verse 15, serpent poured out water like a river out of his mouth after the woman so that he might cause her to be swept away with the flood. Earth helped the woman. Verse 17, 
The dragon was enraged with the woman and went off to make war with the rest of her offspring who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. So he's persecuting the Jews. But the Jews are given a shelter in the wilderness and protected from Satan, so he's even more angry. And so he looks for some additional people to persecute. And lo and behold, he finds those who hold to the testimony of Jesus. I can't imagine who they might be. How about Christians? So they too come under this wrath of Satan. The 70th week of Daniel refers to the final, oh, new definition. What about the 70th week of Daniel? We've already talked about that a little bit. Refers to the final 490 years that God has allotted to Israel in order to accomplish his purposes in preparation for the Messiah's 1,000 year earthly reign. We won't look at the passage, but there it is. Using the same chart again, the 70th week. Covenant is signed. Covenant is signed, begins the 70th week. Notice I put here a time of peace. The covenant is signed. It's a time of peace. No conflicts. Not God's wrath. Not even Satan's wrath at this point. Everyone's getting along. Then we have the good point of the week. And the reign of the beast. Which lasts for 42 months. 1260 days. And three and a half years. There's the end of the 70th week. But if you're, this, is, this part is the the pre-trib position. Second coming, as we will establish, is, a, is going to occur at a different time than that. Continuing with the 70th week, it is separated from the first 69 weeks of years which ended at the Messiah's first coming by an unknown period of time which is the present age. So, some of you are familiar with the 70th week. Again, I don't have time to go into the details. Uh, the chart that you have will discuss that. All the references will be there. You eventually will find it as you look up those references. But there's a gap between the 69th week and the 70th. And that gap is our present age. That's why the 70th week is considered to be yet future. So the final week will begin when a powerful political genius called in Daniel, the prince who is to come, will establish a seven-year covenant with the many and the people of the Middle East. This is so stated in Daniel 9, 27. Then the prince who is to come will establish a covenant with the many for one week. It will end seven years later. That is, the 70th week will end seven years later, just prior to the seventh trumpet in the book of Revelation. In the book of Revelation, we have six, uh, seven trumpets. Uh, at the time when the two witnesses are killed, and again, I'm playing on a frame of reference that some of you may or may not have, time to go into all the details here. Uh, they are killed in the streets of Jerusalem and then 75 days before the Messianic reign will officially begin. Again, you'll find these details in a study of the word sheet. The seven year period of time is never designated in scripture as the tribulation. This is again an assumption to call it tribulation. It's never designated as that. In fact, we really don't have a lot of information about the seven years specifically. But it is indicated to be seven years long. But it is never called the tribulation. And yet this is a standard definition by the pre-trib position. In fact, for that matter, the classic post-trib and even mid-trib position is that the tribulation is the entire seven-year period. And the scriptures support that. Even though the tribulation will actually begin at the midpoint. How about wrath? What about wrath? Christians are promised deliverance from God's end times wrath that will come upon the unbelievers during what is called the day of the Lord. 1 Thessalonians 1.10 says we look for Jesus who delivers us from the wrath to come. And in that context, it is a wrath that is going to come upon those who are left behind. The ones left behind, of course, will be unbelievers. The question remains as to when will they be left behind. Next issue in wrath is that the wrath expressed during the tribulation is not God's wrath. A little bit of repetition here. It is Satan's wrath expressed, God, expressed against God's people, Jews and Christians. It is not wrong to refer to the Jews as God's people. 
They're not believers. A uh, Jew becomes a Christian, of course. But the, the woman who represents uh, unbelieving Israel at that time is still considered God's people because he chose them and has a specific plan for them. A plan which will not be rescinded and will be completed. The reason for Satan's persecution of the Jewish people, by the way, is because since God has a plan for them, the fulfillment of that plan goes to the validity of God's character. Because if Satan can prevent God from fulfilling his promises to the Jews, then you basically have a default on God's part, and Satan wins a conflict. But that's a whole other subject. Further on wrath, God's wrath will not come upon the earth until after the sixth seal, and will be expressed by the trumpets and bowl judgments in Revelation. In Revelation, we have seven seals. Again, all of this is going to be detailed for you on the worksheet. The pre-trib position believes that those seals are the tribulation period and that they represent God's wrath. The problem is God's wrath does not come until the sixth seal. In fact, let's look at it. Revelation 6. We should be at Revelation. It be too difficult here. I'm going to go very quickly. Here. Revelation 6. I'm going to start at verse 1. Verse 2. I looked and behold a white horse, and he who sat on it had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he went out conquering and conquered. This is the beginning of the 70th week. This is when the uh, religious, not religious, uh, the political genius makes the covenant. It doesn't say there's a war, it says he goes out conquering and to conquer. He has the influence to convince everyone to make this covenant. Verse 3, the second seal. Verse 4, another, a red horse went out, and to him sat on it, was granted to take the peace, if you'd like, you can take my word for it, and put the little word the in front of it, for it is there in the Greek. But if you cannot take my word for it, look it up later. <laughs> it should say, take the peace from the earth. Well, what peace? The peace that was just previously established. To take the peace from the earth that men should slay one another, and a great sword was given to him. What happens when the tribulation begins? They kill you. Great persecution begins. Verse 5, third seal. Uh, a black horse came forth, and he had a pair of scales in his hand. Um, verse 6, and I heard as it were a voice in the center of the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a denarius, and three quarts of barley for a denarius, and do not harm the oil and wine. What basically this is talking about is control of the food sources. And that's what the beast does. It controls all the food sources so that no one can buy and sell unless they have the mark of the beast. Again, I'm playing upon a hopeful frame of reference on the part of many of you. <clears throat> the fourth seal, verse 8. An action horse, and he went, uh, and he who sat on it had the name Death. Hades was following with him, and authority was given to him over a fourth of the earth to kill with the sword, famine, pestilence, and wild beasts of the earth. Is there any mention of God's wrath there? To say it's God's wrath is what? I'm going to say, I tell me. Thank you. <laughs> it should say God's wrath if it is. Or there should be something within the context somewhere that establishes it as, as God's wrath. Well, what about the fifth seal in verse 9? I saw underneath the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and because of the testimony which they had maintained. Is that wrath? From God? No, absolutely not. These are Christians being martyred. Okay, verse 12. And I looked when he broke the sixth seal. There was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth, made of hair, and the whole moon became like blood. Sun became dark, moon became dark, stars in the sky fell to the earth, which basically means meteors or the stars and or the stars became dark. Sound familiar? Sun got dark, moon got dark, stars got dark. We just saw that in Matthew 24 as the signs that indicate the end of the tribulation. Verse 14, the sky was split apart like a scroll when it is rolled up, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. <clears throat> now, if all this stuff starts to happen, the people of the earth are going to get pretty shook up, aren't they? But 
what are they going to be thinking? Are they going to be necessarily thinking that God's coming back, that Jesus is coming back? Now think about this. All this says is going to be a lot of heavenly disturbances. They're just going to happen at the same time. So we're going to all be shook up. Wow, everything's dark. But nothing is talking about God yet. So I'm not going to necessarily think that God is coming to judge me. Why would I? This is just a lot of weird stuff happening. We have a lot of weird stuff happening even now. It's just not happening at the same time. Actually, it is. It's just in different locations. But these end time signs are going to occur all simultaneously. And it will be worldwide. <clears throat> so what did we see in Matthew happens after these signs occur? Jesus comes back. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. And then the people of the earth are going to really be afraid. So at first, they're kind of shook up because of all these things are that are happening. Then Jesus comes back. They see him coming back. And verse 15, this is symbolic, by the way, when it says all these guys are going to go hide in the caves of the rock. First of all, it's symbolic because not everybody's going to have a cave to go hide in. You're going to find a cave around here? Verse 15, kings of the earth, the great men, the commanders, and the rich, and the strong, and every slave and free men hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks and the mountains. And they said to the mountains and to the rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the presence of Him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. The Lamb refers to Jesus. For the great day of their wrath has come, and who's able to stand? Why are they making this comment at this point? They're making this comment at this point because after the signs in verses 12 and 13, they see the Son of Man coming. This is not because of this, these, these death, the famine, the, the death uh, uh, by sword and pestilence and wild beasts. That's not why they're saying the wrath of God has come. They're saying the wrath of God has come because they now see Jesus coming in the clouds of the sky. And it doesn't take a rocket scientist to put two and two together. They see Jesus coming. Whether they have been taught anything, whether they know any superstition or not, they see Him coming. And then they say, hide us because the day of their wrath has come. <coughs> Is His wrath being expressed at this particular moment? Some may think yes, but no, it's not. These are just signs. And the visible return of Him. And they say, now hide us from his wrath because the day of his wrath has come. Well, I'm going to jump ahead a little bit. In chapter 7, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth so that no wind should blow on the earth or on the sea or on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the rising of the sun, having a seal, the seal of the living God. And he cried out with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea, saying, Do not harm the earth or the sea or the trees until we have sealed the bond servants. This harming of the earth and the sea, the grass and the trees, this begins with chapter 8 and the trumpets. And this is the wrath of God. This is when the wrath of God will begin. The angels are being held back from pouring out the the wrath of God until these bond servants are sealed, which is another story. The point I'm trying to make is that the wrath of God is about to come. These guys see Jesus coming in the clouds of the sky. Of course they're concerned, and they know that he's come and he's mad. It's like that bumper sticker. Jesus is coming back, and boy, is he mad. Well, they know that he's going to be angry. So they say, hide us from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of their wrath is come. Not has come, not as all these other things that have been going on for months. But it's here. But in actuality, it's not going to come for a little while because the angels say, oh, wait a minute, let's get these new believers sealed, 144,000 Jews who become Christians. Let's, let's get these guys sealed and then let the wrath of God come. So that's basically what this is talking about. The wrath of God begins in chapter 8, verses 1 through 5. Uh, let's look at verse 5. And the angel took the censer and he filled it with the fire of the altar and threw it to the earth. Sound like judgment from God? 
And there followed peals of thunder and the sound of flashes of lightning and another earthquake. How about the day of the Lord definition? It's a period of time that extends from the second coming of Christ until the start of his thousand year reign. It will be preceded by spectacular signs on the earth and in the sun, moon, and stars. Same thing. Sun, moon, and stars are going to be darker. Joel 2.31. You don't need to turn to it unless you want to. It says, and there will be, <coughs> and the sun, sun will be darkened, the, the moon will be darkened, the stars will not give their light before the day of the Lord comes. So what this allows us to do is equate the second coming of Jesus in Matthew 24, 30, with the coming of the day of the Lord in Joel 2, 31, because they are both immediately preceded by the signs of the sun, moon, and stars. It also helps us place Revelation 6, 14, no, uh, 12 through 14, at the same place, because we have the same three signs. The darkening of the sun and the stars. So that's why I have Joel 2 31 to 6 12 there of Revelation. The day of the Lord will occur, will not occur until sometime after the man of lawlessness is revealed and the tribulation begins. In 2 Thessalonians 2 1 through 3, which was discussed this morning by our brother Jerry Powers, <clears throat> it says in the New American Standard that the day of the Lord will not come until the apostasy comes first, the rebellion of of the world, of believers, whatever is involved, some rebellion against God until the apostasy comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed. That is referring to the man of lawlessness being revealed as the beast at the midpoint of the week when he sets up that abomination of desolation. Because the chapter continues and says he places himself in the temple of God and proclaims himself as God. The apostasy is what Jesus described as... <clears throat> When the, the love of many will grow cold and they will betray one another, give up one another, that's the apostasy, the rebellion, the falling away from the faith. It also says that we saw in Jesus that because of the lawlessness is increased, this would refer primarily to the unbelievers becoming so anarchistic, so lawless, that they don't care about other people and they will be killing one another in order to acquire the benefits that come from beast worship. Which again, everyone who takes the mark of the beast will be able to buy and sell. If you don't have the mark of the beast, you can't buy or sell. <clears throat> uh, the day of the Lord that will occur after the tribulation has been cut short. A little repetition here to help amplify it. And Jesus comes from the clouds of the sky with power and great glory, which we read at Matthew 24. Since the coming of Christ will come like a thief in the night, the day of the Lord will likewise come like a thief in the night. Okay. In Matthew 24, Jesus said, no one knows the day or the hour. Likewise in Matthew 24, Jesus said that if the head of the house had known what hour of the night the thief was going to come, he would have protected himself and not let the thief come in. So you too, likewise, be ready because you don't know the day or the hour or the hour of the night that your Lord is coming. So who is the one who invented? Who is the one who first used the thief in the night concept? Jesus. And in what context? The context of Matthew 24, which is his second coming after the tribulation of those days has been cut short. So when it says at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 3, that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night, Paul is using terminology that was first established by who? By Jesus. Where? In Matthew 24, in all of that discourse. The only two passages that can be used to establish the pre-tribulation pre view of imminence is... No one knows the day or the hour or thief in the night. And they both come from Matthew 24. The only other thing that pre-trib imminence theory uses is the idea that we are to expect and look for the Lord. But expectation and looking for does not violate the concept that certain things must precede his arrival. 2 Peter 3.10 likewise says that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. Peter also uses the same language that Jesus established. This terminology was not established by Paul or Peter. 
here, but they're playing upon what Jesus already taught. He will come like a thief in the night. If you know what time the thief was coming, you would have prepared yourself. In the Old Testament days, the, uh, the day of the Lord is characterized primarily by God's judgment upon the unbelieving world. We won't take time to look at these passages. I have to finish up real quick. In the New Testament, the focus is on the judgment from God's wrath that will come on the unbelievers after the rapture of the church. These passages established. The second coming. There is only one second coming. Every time the second coming is mentioned by Jesus, Matthew 16, Matthew 24, John 14, they all refer to the same second coming. There is no logical, reasonable explanation to say that Jesus is talking about two second comings. For the disciples are constantly saying, when, is it, when will you come back? What is the sign of your coming? And just a few days after he gave the discourse in Matthew 24, saying that uh, <clears throat> these things will precede his coming, and that he will come at an unknown day or an hour and come like a thief. Just a few days later, he said to the disciples in the upper room, in my father's house are many places to dwell. If it weren't true, I tell you that. I'm coming, I'm coming back again. And when I come back, I will receive you. I'll take you to myself. Now what coming is he talking about? The same one that he's been talking about every single time he talks about it. Not one that occurs, not, oh, and what I just quoted from John 14, 1 through 3, that's obviously the rapture, right? And so the rapture occurs at the second coming, the same second coming that he's been talking about all throughout his ministry. So all these passages, I'm giving you a little bit of time right now, all of these passages are referring to the same thing. After he ascended to the Father in Acts chapter 1, the disciples stand there looking up. Where do you go? Where do you go? A couple of angels show up and say, why do you stand there looking up into the sky? The same Jesus who you saw go up into the clouds is going to come back. Second coming. He's going to come back the same way you saw him go up. Is this a different second coming? And you may be thinking, and you may ask about it, well, what about this coming in Revelation 19? I saw heaven open, and here comes the Lord Jesus Christ on a white horse, and a bunch of armies following him on white horses, and they come down and they knock some heads together, and together. Is it this the second coming? No, it's not. The second coming already occurred back at the sixth seal. Yeah, but that looks like a second coming. What we have to distinguish between is his arrival in the clouds of the sky, at which time every eye will see him. He comes in glory. The rapture occurs. He pours out judgment through the trumpets and the bulls. And then part of that judgment is Armageddon. And when it says heaven open, it doesn't mean he comes from heaven. It doesn't simply means from the perspective of the earth dwellers. Heaven is open and here comes Jesus down to the earth. Prior to that, he did not come down to the earth. Now, I know I'm giving a lot of information very quickly. But that's what this is basically designed to do, is give you a, 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 a preview, an introduction to the pre wrath rapture. Definition of the second coming. Second coming is the arrival of Jesus in the clouds of the sky with power and glory, blast of the trumpet. He will come like a thief in the night at an unknown day and hour. See, this is taken into consideration everything we've already looked at. He will rescue all living believers from the earth by gathering them to himself in the sky. At that time, Jesus will begin to pour out his wrath upon unbelievers. We've been looking at Matthew 24. Another passage, another verse I forgot to mention is right after ch uh, chapter 24, verse 30, where it says, Then they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of the sky. The very next verse says, And then he will send forth his angels, and he will gather his elect from the four winds of the earth, from one end of the sky to the other end of the sky. What's that sound like? Sounds like a rapture. Free trip says, no, that's the gathering of the Jews into the land of Palestine. <laughs> that is an assumption. But aren't you making an assumption when you say it's the rapture? No, because as you continue reading, he says, then there will be two men in the field. One will be taken and one will be left. Oh, but he's taken in judgment. The word there, I don't know if you were in Matthew 24, but the word taken there is parlamon, taken to the side of, or received to the side of. 
It's the very same word that John, uh, Jesus used in, in, in John 14 when he said, I will come back and I'll take you to myself. Very same word. And where do we, how can we say that that language refers to anything other than the gathering that Jesus just mentioned? He will send forth his angels and he will gather his elect. Oh, but see, he sends forth his angels to gather. Why does the Bible says he gathers it? No, you look at Mark once again, and Mark says, then he will send forth his angels and he will gather his elect. You see, he can use angels to do it, and he's still doing it, right? That's a problem. Should be no problem at all. So it says he will gather his elect. One will be in the two will be in the field, one will be taken, one will be left. Who's taken? The one who's gathered. Who's left? The unbeliever. Chronological accuracy. We looked at the chronology of Matthew 24. Hopefully that's clear. You'll need to review it, obviously. 2 Thessalonians 2, 1 through 3. Before the day of the Lord comes, must occur the apostasy. And the man of the law must be given chronological accuracy. You cannot get around it. Unless you redefine apostasy there. And that was discussed this morning in the second session. First session. And that was that the word apostasy there means a rebellion. Pre-trib likes to define it as a departure. In fact, they like to say, the day of the Lord will not come unless the rapture comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed. Some of you may have heard that position. But of course the word means apostasy. Chronology in Revelation 6 through 19. Don't have time to go through it. But again, as you have a lot of references, 53 references on the worksheet. And with this introduction, hopefully you can get a good idea. Who are the recipients in Matthew 24? This is a big deal. Jesus is not writing and uh, speaking to the church. He's not speaking to uh, Christians. He's speaking to the Jews. No, he's not. He's speaking to his disciples. His disciples are the ground layers for the church. They are the foundation builders of the church. He's writing to, the, to, to his disciples as those who will take this information and use it to pass on. And that's exactly what they did. Peter did it. John did it. Paul came on a little bit later. He did it. Jesus is speaking to the disciples as the representatives of the church, as the ones who will take this information and pass it on to the church. It is to the church and for the church. Same way with other passages in Matthew and Jesus' teaching. The great Beatitudes is an awful subject on that, but Matthew 5 through 7. They say, oh, this is not for the church, this is for the Jews. It says right in there that uh, if you have a problem with your brother, then take your offering to the altar. Well, that's not for the church. No, everything else in there is for the church, and that is for the church in principle. Well, why is it there then? Because he's talking to people who do operate in the realm of the temple at that time. But the principle, the spiritual truths that are there are universally, universally uh, applied to and for the church. <clears throat> oh, I wish I could have got into 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, or chapter 1. I'm going to. <laughs> 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, because this is crucial. If some of you have not been challenged by now, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, I almost guarantee you, will challenge you to the uttermost. <clears throat> Verse 4 of 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. Therefore we ourselves speak proudly of you among the churches of God for your perseverance and faith in the midst of all your persecutions and afflictions which you endure. This is a plain indication of God's righteous judgment, so that you may be considered worthy of the kingdom of God, for which indeed you are suffering. For after all, it is only just for God to repay with affliction. The word affliction is the same word for tribulation, the exact same Greek word for tribulation. Now God is repaying with affliction those who afflict you. This is the same word too, only it's a verb. So the Thessalonian believers are in a period of tribulation. They are in a period of affliction. And Paul was saying, you know, it's right for God to judge those who are afflicting you. 
and to give relief to you who are afflicted. Same word. So here Paul says, you know, God's going to give relief to you guys and to us also when the Lord Jesus will be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire. What in the world is Paul talking about here? He's talking about living Thessalonian Christians who are under affliction, tribulation type pressure right now, saying, it's only right for God to judge these guys who are afflicting you. What Paul is teaching them or telling them here is that there is a possibility that the tribulation that they are experiencing could possibly escalate into the final tribulation. It could escalate into that. See, that, that is an unknown factor. When is this tribulation going to begin in the first century period? It could. Paul says it could happen. And if that is the case, if it does escalate into that final period of tribulation, you're going to be given relief. You're going to be rescued when Jesus comes back. And is this just a, a, an invisible pre-trib position, an invisible arrival of Jesus in the sky? No, it says when he's revealed with his mighty angels and flaming fire. That's not either invisible or restricted. And of course it says at that time that he's going to deal out retribution to those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel. That refers to the judgment that will come upon the unbelievers. And of course, ultimately, verse 9, they will pay the penalty. This definitely offers a promise of deliverance for living Christians at a vis visible, physical, and glorious return of Jesus Christ, not some invisible arrival. So that is a very important uh, chronological passage. Comparison of passages, very important, but I don't have time to go into it. Uh, I'll leave that up for a little while. And actually, maybe I'll come back and see what I've got left. Uh, coming up the Lord. <laughs> it, no, it, has, it always that way, isn't it? There's the, hey, there's the worksheet. I'm almost done. But look at all these references. So I will leave them up here. And I will, while they're up there, we can open it up for questions right now. I don't know how much time I've got. I can really use some quick art. Our question and answer time have on. Anyway, any questions? 